All right, let's go part three. My little buddy Bob was <laughs> shaking. Let's go part three of our study on uh, our research on where the real estate opportunities lay in the next 10 years or so. This is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, so the uh, the research these guys did in 2012 covered 2000, 2010, two, I mean 2010 to 2020. Well, here we are, the late part of 2019. So now it's where 2020 to 2030 come to be. And this is where it gets kind of sneaky So uh, and, and, and frightening in a way. So let's dive into this. So what they're showing here is they have three scenarios. So a weak, a medium, and a strong economic recovery and support for home ownership, right? So the basically they're saying uh, we have debt levels rescind, uh, income levels grow, more households are being formu formulated, you know, more and more people are having kids, there's more immigration, the whole thing. That's on the positive side. The, the negative side is debt levels are still rising, incomes are staying moderately low, uh, people aren't moving out of mom's basement. Uh, people aren't getting married and, and that stuff. I would add to that actually, uh, more and more women staying in the workforce for sure. I don't, I don't know why that's even controversial, but I, I, I find it to be, you have less households when women go to work. That's, you can say as good or bad, I don't care, but just think about it. If you go, if you're a woman, you, you know, busted your butt for freaking, you know, five years at college or whatever, and you got this degree and you know, you're $60,000 in debt, what's the likelihood that you're going to marry some guy and just stay home? It's not very high, not very high. Now, what my wife and I did is, you know, she and I both were for four years before we decided to get married. And this is happening more and more. And we didn't have our first kid till she was 29. Now it's 30. All right. So that's, we're going to see that more and more. Uh, but luckily we didn't have any student loan debt because I have a GI Bill and the Army College Fund. So we got her student debt loan debt paid, and then we started to uh, really think about the formation of a of a family, of a household. And now, if you're 35, if you're getting out of college now, and you get 80, 90, 100 thousand debt between both y'all, you might say, let's wait until we get some of this uh, paid off a little bit before we start formulating a house and buying a home and having kids. And I think that's more likely, actually. All right, and I hate to be a pessimistic, uh, you know, here, but I am going to go look at the weak side of this because I think it's important to understand. All right. So the projections point to further further differences between the low and high scenarios in the 2020s. The number of houses released by baby boomers in the 2020s, and again, this is why I want to point this out, because A, we're right on the cusp of this, the precipice, if you will, and B, uh, is when the mass amount of baby boomers are, are releasing their homes into the, the stock of housing, for sure. And then 2030, it'll, it'll settle down. So the next 10 years are huge. And the latter part of 2020 is going to be gigantosaurus. A gi ginormous, as my daughter would say. Uh, the, the, the number of houses released by the baby boomers will increase in the 20s, most of which will be owner-occupied dwellings. Under the low scenario, the weak economic scenario, new owners will absorb only 300,000 more owner-occupied units than the seniors would release. And we also know what kind of houses the new owners will buy, most likely. Not the large plots, you know, four, I don't know how four, I guess, you know, three, 3,500 square foot, way out in the exurbs on a, you know, acre and a half of land. Most likely they're not going to do that. Again, we don't know, but that's the, the theory behind this. It's going to be closer to the, uh, the working centers of town. Uh, so in the outer suburbs, you can, and then you can make a case that that could hurt the schools in the outer suburbs as more people are leaving there and moving closer in I, yeah, I don't know about that i don't know but uh i do i do think if you have a smaller family uh dynamic today and you're not thinking you're gonna have a bigger family you're most likely to buy a three and two bedroom and bathroom as opposed to four and three if that makes sense and so because of that the bigger houses on further out i would think would be uh could be could be sitting on uh, some serious downside this near parity, again, 300,000 more are going to be uh, consumed that are coming on the, and that are coming by supply of just the baby boomers, not including new uh, construction. So that's parity. This near parity at the national scale will mean that many local markets would be deeply oversupplied. Established homeowners who sought to move or uh, who sought to move or their heirs would presumably adjust by lowering their expected sales price, converting their dwellings to rentals, leaving them vacant, potentially for seasonal use, or abandoning them outright. As is already the case because of the housing crisis, many now many non-senior homeowners who wish to move would be under unable to do so because of underwater mortgages. 
in the high scenario, by contrast, where everyone's doing great, everybody's happy. Everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you work like a team. Where's that from? Uh, in the high scenario, by contrast, new owners would outnumber seniors, releasing dwellings by more than 10 million. Even the 2020s, Echo Boomers will play an important role in generating demand for existing and new housing. They account for about 45% of the new homeowners in all of these scenarios. Even that, though, even if there's a, there's a, a huge uh, uh, increasing demand, well, you still have to level off of the price because there's still a huge increasing supply. So even if the demand is keep up with the supply, you know, what you still, it's still going to be at a parity in terms of prices. Now they might not have to drop the prices in order to get out from under the home. Like they're saying that they would have to in the low scenario. Again, uh, let's see, established home, homeowners who sought to move presumably would adjust their own prices, i.e. lower them for their expected sales. But if that's, that's a 300,000 more demand than sellers but even that's still parity because you do have new construction but even if you have a, a larger demand than sellers we well, still have this huge amount of sellers relative to what we have today and i just i find that to be either way there's gonna be opportunity here even the 2020s uh we talk about the three scenarios produce vast differences in the share of news households who rent versus own their homes in the next two decades in the low scenario about 40 percent of new households formed between 2010 and 20 would own their homes man in the medium, the figure is about 55%. In the high scenario, it's about 67%. The differences are even more pronounced in the 2020s when home ownership among new households ranged from 5% under the low scenario uh, to 77% uh, of the high scenario. Notwithstanding predictions of a coming rentership society, none of the scenarios indicates a reduction in the U.S. home ownership between, but below 60%. I get that. So... Uh, uh, the the lowest national rate of home ownership, about 60.6%, would come on, on, under the low scenario in 2030. So basically, what they're saying is uh, we might have a, a reducing supply of homeowners, but they don't expect it to be lower than 60% ever, even under the lowest scenario. Echo Boomer's decisions about whether to form and when to form households and seek home ownership will have important effects on the housing construction after houses that are currently vacant or being held off the market have been sold. Census results from 2009 show that between one fifth and one third of houses owned by people under 35 are newly constructed. Yeah, I, that's uh, higher than the rates of new hoc occupancy by other age groups. New construction also accounts for between 12 and 16 percent of the rental units occupied by young adults. I, so the echo boomers who are going to have to maintain uh, the housing stock of a demand for the housing stock that's coming to the market in mass, uh, they don't want, I mean, not they, I, I hate to say day, but they want the new houses. They don't want to go into your, your house that's got, you know, the 1970s shag carpet. So that's going to be even bigger. So don't forget, this is just the houses are owned occupied houses already there come to the market. Never mind the new, the new construction. They don't want that, man. They're going to be looking at new houses, new construction with the most updated amenities. They're not going to want your 1980s style or 1970s style thing with a phone on the wall and your pink uh, 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 toilet trees and stuff like that. They don't want that. They want it updated. So now you got it in increasing supply. Uh, so now they got their choice between Grandma Jones's houses from the 1970s and 80s or this brand new Spranken uh, new new construction home where they can get everything thrown in there for one low price with a mortgage payment of whatever it is. Ah, man, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Echo, okay. Yeah, Echo Boomers will account for a larger share of the pool of potential buyers uh, that are homes that are released by seniors over the next two decades. Against the backdrop of persistent vacancies, foreclosures, and delinquencies in owner-occupied housing, some observers have announced the arrival of the Rentership Society. Rental vacancies have declined and asking rates are higher levels than before the housing crisis. Between five and six million new renter households will form over the next decade. Almost all this increase reflects demand from echo boomers. The median scenario yields a net increase of about 5.4 billion renters or 400,000 more than the increase in renters between 200, uh, 2000 and 2010. The high scenario assumes, uh, okay. 
Growth and demand for rental housing between 2020 and 2030 is likely to be smaller than current decades simply because the baby boomer generation uh, will be growing up essentially and transitioning to home ownership. All right, so let's just uh, let's put a wrap on this part three. I, I'm going to look at some data from the Census Bureau, which I'll share with you once I get my spreadsheet done, uh, Zillow. So what to make of all this? I think the home ownership formation is slowing down. I do. I think it's slowing down. I think because of that, the people who do buy homes also have a incentive to want to buy a new home. I do believe that. I'm not sh quite so sure they're going to want to buy closer to the urban areas. I look at a place like Ashburn, Virginia, if you will. Um, but I have a, you know, that that's not, but I mean, as the urban area maybe moves out like here in Alfreda, Georgia, I mean, that's kind of moved out. So I'm not so sure what to make of that. I think household formations are going to be, are, are going to be slower. And I think it's probably, so if someone was born in 1981 right now, they are 39, they're probably forming their household. Someone born in 1995 right now is what, 25, right? They're probably going to wait five to 10 years to form their household. Right when they're forming their household, yeah, they'll be 35. Right when they're forming their household, which I think is, is more reasonable, and in between that is when you're going to have this huge flux of baby boomers. So I'm thinking five years when, a, when the echo boomer who was born in 1995, it'll be 2025, yeah, oh man, that's when that's when there's gonna be this huge supply of homes coming from the baby boomers. And you're gonna have these echo boomers are gonna be looking, but they don't want the baby boomers' houses. And then, I mean I don't want to say they don't, they will, but that's you're gonna have this huge supply of housing. And you have a, a decent demand, but I tell you, I don't think the demand is gonna meet the housing supply at all. I think in 2025, I, I think you could get by with some serious home ownership. Uh, with hardly that much money. I, and I, I don't know what the, hardly that much money means. I don't know. But the median house value right now in the U.S. is 220 I mean, let's just say you could get a rental for 150 Rent that sucker out for the equivalent of today of a, you know, of a 1500 bucks, which is the equivalent of a $300,000 home. You have the Echo Boomer forming families, but they're forming families... And a lot of these guys still remember the Great Recession. A lot of them are buying into the idea of renting. I, would, I mean, look, this is just my speculation. And a lot of baby boomers are selling. And so now you have people selling. You could buy and turn around rent. I, I absolutely, I see, I don't want to be involved in that thing. But you could buy to live. You could buy a turn around rent because you'll have a, a larger demand historically of, of uh, echo boomers who are forming families but don't want to lock themselves down because they remember what it was like to be underwater, uh, to be upside down where they couldn't move or their parents couldn't move or something like that or their brother. So they don't want to go through that. So say let's just rent, recognizing that you know they're, they're going to pay a higher cost. And don't forget, it's easier to get into a rental than it is to get a mortgage. I mean, rental, you just got to have, what, two, uh, two months of, uh, of a down payment. I think 2025 is going to be a big year. You could find some serious good prices on houses in 2025 in areas with good schools, because these guys still want to rent in a good school district. Uh, that will be bigger than probably the, the echo boomer really needs, but will be bigger. They still want the modern amenities, uh, but in a good school district close enough where they can commute still. Um, still be able to get home quickly enough to see the soccer games and whatnot. And then, you know, once they, once they're more secure in their own outcome, they could turn around, you know, five years later after they rent from you for a couple years and buy something themselves. I just find this incredibly interesting. It's fascinating. We'll see how it shakes out, but uh, stay with me for part four. I'll put that up later when I, when I look at the spreadsheets I have, because uh, it's interesting on how this works. How can you take advantage of it? I think you got to have cash. I think you have to have cash sit on the side to get ready to take advantage of this, uh, this potential opportunity. Once in a lifetime, really it's once in a lifetime. We'll see. All right, we'll see. Don't forget to subscribe.